For those of you, of you who have not met me, I'm, I'm Nigel Bigger, and I direct the McDonald Centre for, Ethic, uh, for Theology, Ethics and Public Life here in Oxford. Um, so it's my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you all to what I'm confident will be a very fertile and uh, important discussion. Um, since uh, our conference on academic freedom under threat, what's to be done, uh, could not happen without the support of the McDonald Center, uh, which uh, was generously endowed by the McDonald Agave Foundation some years ago. I must thank the foundation for its support, and uh, Peter McDonald, its president, is sitting to my right. So, Peter, thank you. Uh, you are the sine qua non. We wouldn't be here without you. Um, Unusually for the McDonald Centre, participation in this conference has been by invitation only. Um, can I make clear that the reason for this is not that we're trying to hide? Um, the reason for it is that uh, a small group of people with a track record of uh, experience and reflection is better able to sustain a focused and coherent discussion uh, than a conference open to all comers. That's the main reason. Uh, we limited numbers, and this format is more intimate and makes for better conversation. And you can't have a cast of hundreds here. And we do want our discussions over the next 36 hours to get somewhere, to begin to answer the question, what is to be done? However, the other reason for restricting participation and for not advertising the conference publicly has been to reduce the risk of attracting attempts to stop or disrupt our proceedings. Uh, that might have been unnecessary, I, I, it may well have been unnecessary, uh, but given recent events, um, I thought it prudent to err on the side of paranoia. <laughs> <laughs> now, the title of the conference and all of the speakers and its structure uh, take for granted that there is a problem. There is a problem. That academic freedom is under various kinds of threat. Uh, but as many of you will know, not everyone agrees with that, uh, especially on the political left. For that reason, uh, we have selected speakers and participants without any conscience, co conscious, conscious reference to which newspapers they read or who they vote for, uh, solely on the ground of their expertise uh, on an interest in the topic. Uh, I know uh, for a certainty that there are people in this room who read The Guardian every day. <laughs> I know that because we have uh, one journalist from The Guardian here, and I assume he reads his newspaper. <laughs> I also know it because I subscribe to The Guardian, as well as to The Times. And I would be most surprised if every one of our uh, US uh, participants uh, all uh, supported <coughs> President Trump. I might be surprised. I don't know. Uh, but because there is a substantial body of opinion on the left that thinks that anxiety about academic freedom is merely a symptom of right-wing insecurity, I thought it would be intellectually honest uh, to invite someone to come here and tell us why we are mistaken to think there's a problem. So uh, last October, I invited Dr. Will Davis, a political economist at Goldsmiths uh, College in London, uh, who had previously uh, published an article in, uh, um, in July of last year in The Guardian under the title, The Truth About the Free Speech Panic, the Supposed Crisis of Free Expression is Really a Crisis of Conservatism. Uh, when I invited Dr. Davis, I told him, frankly, he'd be in a minority of one, uh, but uh, that nevertheless we would welcome uh, hearing what he had to say and uh, his gingering up our, our discussions. Uh, he replied promptly, uh, succinctly and politely, declaring with admirable candid candor uh, that he was not interested in participating. Uh, since Dr. Davis is not here to represent his own views, uh, let me represent them for him. <laughs> and I suggest that we all take note of them, consider how true they are in the course of our discussions, and collect our thoughts in the concluding session. Here are the main claims that he made in his Guardian article, and there are seven of them. First, 
the proliferation of social media, etc., platforms, the prol proliferation of platforms that grant anyone a public voice should put concerns about censorship to rest. Second, the online mobilization of aggressive criticism may be unattractive, but it's not censorship. Third, the claim that certain people are being silenced, quote, is often a convenient spin on the way this messier, less predictable world means prominent voices have lost authority. Fourth, conservatives complain simply because left-wing ideas are crowding out right-wing ones. Fifth, the left is not uniquely intolerant of dissent. Sixth, the right is more strongly represented in the private sector media where market forces determine which voices get to speak, whereas the left is stronger in universities where the selection of voices is governed by, and I quote, critical judgment and public reputation. And seventh, the free speech panic is really alarm at the opening up of debate to a broader range of perspectives. So there's at least uh, one um, um, critique of the assumption that most of us, all of us, are making in this room. So let's bear it in mind and uh, respond to it uh, at the end of our deliberations. Uh, let me introduce um, our two speakers uh, who will speak one after the other. Uh, the first to speak is uh, Eric Kaufman, um, the title of his uh, uh, lecture will be PC Politeness and Campus Outrage, The Two Phases of the Cultural Left. Uh, Eric is Professor of Politics at Birkbeck in London uh, and author of White Shift, Populism, Immigration and the Future of White Majorities, which was published last year. So welcome, Eric. And our, uh, following Eric, um, Heather Haying will uh, speak to us. Uh, Heather... Uh, will speak under the title of Orthodoxy and Heterodoxy, a Conflict at the Core of Education. And she describes herself as a, an evolutionary biologist and professor in exile. So, um, over to you, Eric. Great, great. And I might stand, uh, if that's all right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Nigel. And uh, it's very honored to be at such a, an illustrious gathering. Um, so really what I want to do today is talk, first of all, about what I think the problem is what I think the solution might be, and then talk a little bit about my, some of my personal experiences and how they may shed light on that. Um, so the first point I, I kind of want to make is that I think the problem is ideological and not psychological. And even though I love uh, Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt's book on the coddling of the American mind, I don't actually think a sort of fragile new generation of social media addicts is really the problem. I think it is really a long-standing ideology which is weaponizing and using the idiom of safety and therapy uh, to its advantage. And this ideology, uh, which has been mapped by a number of, of speakers, uh, John McWhorter calls it the religion of anti-racism. Um, and this, if you think about a kind of totem pole here where we have uh, disadvantaged racial groups at the top and then we have gender and sexual groups, number two, and then disability, weight, looks, class, everything else, there's a sort of tipping of the cap to that, but no real major sustained interest in that. So you have a kind of hierarchy, which also means that racial minority activist movements don't tend to be split along gender lines the same way that, say, a feminist movement would be split along racial lines or would have racial splits within it. And that's because of this victim-oppressor hierarchy in this ideology. So the question that's, that's you know, what is this ideology and where does it come from? I think we first have to concern ourselves with that. I think this is a long-standing and not a post-2013 or recent uh, ideology. The sacred value, the, the underlying sacred value of this ideology is that there are protected totemic victim groups and thou shall not offend the most sensitive member of such a group or the most sensitive member imaginable by a progressive mind reader. So it doesn't actually have to be an actual individual. But because it's a, the standard that's being used here is the most offensive, uh, sorry, the most offended individual and not the most, uh, not a reasonable individual standard, this is why the ideology so, frequent, uh, so frequently is in conflict with the law, which operates on a reasonable individual and not a most sensitive individual standard. 
So the question then becomes, well, where does this come from? And I, there's a lot on this graph, and I'm not going <laughs> to talk you through it. Um, I, I'm violating every, every rule in PowerPoint. But it's just to say, this is not socialism that, that we're facing, actually. And it's not liberalism. It, liberalism and socialism, have, or liberal capitalism, have both moderated for various reasons. What hasn't moderated, I think, is a strain of thought that I would call kind of cultural anarchism uh, or modernism, which is sort of what Daniel Bell called the, the adversary culture, anti-traditional. And that, has, that is a separate development from socialism and liberal capitalism through the 19th and 20th century. As communism starts to run into trouble, first the Stalinist purges and show trials in the 30s, but certainly with 1989, we get a, 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 a movement of communist intellectuals into this modernist stream. And that creates what I call the left modernist fusion. So left modernism is really the ideology that we are confronting. And it is at its absolute peak of influence. It's been building since the early 20th century, which I want to suggest the ideas had already crystallized by the early 20th century. But for various reasons, the expansion of university television, perhaps the internet, it has now reached a peak of influence. And what this really is about is two things. One is the equity side, which is weakening strong cultural groups. And the other is the diversity side. Emphasis on the new and different hostility to tradition. And that's really coming from modernism and not so much from the left. Together, they're forming this compound, which is this new ideology. And it can take a left-wing form in progressive socialism and anarchism, but also a right-wing form, progressive neoliberalism, woke corporations, what David Brooks called bobos, people who are kind of aggressively bourgeois in their economic life, but very bohemian in their cultural life. So you, you kind of have a right-wing take on this as well. Um, OK, so I just want to suggest that, again, that this ideology had come together already by the 1920s. And here's a quote. Uh, and this is by no means unique by, from H.L. Mencken. But 1923, we talk about cancel white people today and hostility to white privilege. But so here we have somebody critiquing the Anglo-Saxon American. And the normal American of the pure-blooded majority goes to rest every night with an uneasy feeling there's a burglar under the bed, i.e. other ethnic groups who are trying to unseat him in the hierarchy. His political ideas are crude and shallow. He's almost wholly devoid of aesthetic feeling. The most elementary facts about the universe alarm him. Uh, he, you try to educate him, he remains palpably third rate. So what I'm suggesting is that this kind of anti-white thing that we see today has roots that go back all the way to the late 1910s and 20s. Similarly, with the call-out culture, again, I would argue that these ideas had come together by the 20s and 30s. And what occurs, actually, with the Stalinist purges is a lot of communist intellectuals move into this anti-communist left stream, that anti-communist left modernist stream. And so, for example, the art of Thomas Hart Benton and, and a lot of the uh, artists of the New Deal period that were sponsored by the New Deal administration celebrated the American past. That was seen as nationalistic. And, and that was then derided as Nazi or fascism. So you, you get these, this discourse that if you want to be in the high culture, you, can, you have to be cosmopolitan. You cannot be nationalistic, or we're going to call you a Nazi, a, a racist, or a fascist. This is happening already by the late 30s. So I don't actually think these ideas are so radically new. Yes, there are some new things. We're talking about trans. But the, the core of that sort of outlook was already there. What then occurs is a massive scaling up. Uh, and again, Daniel Bell writes about this, um, because of television and the university sector. If we look at the use of the terms racist and sexist in English language publications, and you can do this for other West European languages, um, you see a sharp rise in the use of that term racism from the late or mid-60s up to about 1970. That's the first kind of big rise. A second rise in the sort of politically correct era, late 1980s, early 90s. And then subsequently, we've seen another rise post-2013. So these are essentially what Toby Young calls the great awakenings of this ideology, right? Just, just like American Protestantism has had its great awakenings in the you know, 1725, 50, 1815 to 40. And, and so you've had these periodic enthusiasms, but they're all because of that underlying ideological structure. And similarly, these, I think we pay too much attention to these campus antics and the upsurges, we miss what's going on underneath, which is this ideology uh, of left modernism, which is driving all of this. Um, and there was thing, things happening in the 60s that were equally crazy to anything we've seen today. So black students in 1968, San Francisco State University, they demanded 50 black studies and ethnic studies positions. They demanded every non-white student be admitted who applied. 
They struck for nine months until the administration caved in. So these things were already happening. Uh, social media might make it easier to, to get a flash mob together, but I want to suggest this is a long-standing ideological problem. It's nothing really to do with a certain generation and its fragile psychology. Um, now, how do we deal with this? I mean, one of the th I'm a social scientist, so one of the things I'm interested in is system dynamics. Um, and I think you've really got two actors here. One is the, uh, the activists who I'm portraying as the shepherd, and then you have a, a, a mass of sort of the center-left liberal uh, element in academia who are the sheep here who kind of follow the shepherd. And I want to ask, well, why are they following the shepherd? The, the point about th any kind of complex system like a herd is all it takes is a few sheep and then the others will follow. So if you can just move a certain critical mass beyond a tipping point, then everything else follows. Um, so what we have here is sort of the hot call-out culture of chanting and mobbing, no platforming activists. But more important than that, I think, is the politically correct mass going on in the herd here, observing these lines, not crossing these lines. Both the sort of banal PC side and the hot call-out culture, I think, are two faces of the same, again, the same left modernist ideology interacting in this complex system. The question then in terms of dealing with this is going to be, how do we prize enough sheep? We're never going to convince these radicals. How do we prize enough sheep away from this herd to start the stampede moving the other direction. That's going to be the key. So this is all about complex systems. Um, so a flock of birds is another example of the complex system where there's no actual bird controlling the behavior of the flock. If there's a perturbation, all the birds will follow where a few have led. Um, and, and we see this in markets. So if we think, if I think a stock is worth $50, but it's not what I think the stock is actually worth. It's what I think other people think it's worth. And if I think other people think it's worth only 30 and enough people think like me, then the stock price starts to fall, which reinforces those perceptions, and you're into this crash kind of feedback. And I think the same thing is occurring with um, political correctness and these mobbings, where you know, I may not think Jordan Peterson is a racist, but it's what do I think other people are thinking, number one. Um, and if I think other people think he's a racist, then maybe I'm not going to say anything. Or if I think other people are going to abide by the norm set by the radicals that says he's a racist, then his reputation will be trashed. And then as his reputation sinks, more people who are sitting on the fence will virtue signal in the direction of, yes, he's a racist. They'll sort of jump on board. And then you get, again, this sort of feedback spiral and his reputation tanks. So that's an example. Again, the same sort of system dynamics are occurring. How do we uh, begin then to offset these trends? Um, so what's going on now? Forget about the radicals and the call-out mobs. They're never going to change their mind. Tr how do we get to the mass of sort of reasonable center-left liberal people in that herd who feel they have to virtue signal, feel they have to play along? Because if they don't, they will be called racist or conservative or something like that. Um, well, the way to do it, I think, is to raise the costs. So they then have to think not just about offending the radicals, but also, um, well, if we shut down this speaker, uh, maybe our university is going to get a bad name. Maybe the press is going to make fun of us. Maybe our students, our donors, politicians will come down on us. That kind of thinking means that they will, take a, they will pause and they won't just jump in and immediately cave into the radicals. So you have to have a counterforce that can work on enough members of the herds. Once you get enough of them separated, then the others will follow and you can break the cycle. Um, the second point I have to make is, is really about the sociology of deviance, which is about how social norms are set. Social norms, there's always a struggle over norm boundaries. One group wants to expand the meaning of a term like racism to include, let's say, wearing a Chinese prom dress. <laughs> others, others are trying to actually fight against those norms. And this is really an anarchic struggle. If a group tries to expand the norm and no one pushes back, that's the new norm, and it gets set. If the norm is broken by a challenge, then the norm disappears, right? So there's always a struggle over norm boundaries. And that's why it's very important any attempt to expand these norms to include <laughs> silly things such as Chinese prom dresses as cultural appropriation has to be resisted. You cannot allow that norm slippage, or else that then settles down and becomes a new front in this struggle. Uh, one way to get around this is that whenever superlative claims are made about harms to disadvantaged groups, Survey evidence can be used to debunk uh, many of those claims. I'll try and show how 
I, I, we tried, myself and Matthew Goodwin tried to do that um, after an event that we both took part in, which is where it gets personal now, which is the, um, an event that uh, Matthew Goodwin, who's a political scientist at the University of Kent and myself, uh, put on at the Conway Hall in London. This is an off-campus event. We got about 400 people to this event. Uh, we also had uh, Trevor Phillips, Afro-Caribbean, in the Remain campaign, hardly an alt-right supporter. Uh, uh, David Aronovich, again, left liberal, <laughs> strong Remain supporter. Claire Fox, um, former communist turn, I suppose, libertarian. But anyway, we, uh, we have this debate. It was entitled, Is Rising Ethnic Diversity a Threat to the West? Now, it's a provocative title. Absolutely, and that was what it was intended to be because we wanted to get a debate going on this topic that everybody was talking about. Um, and it's also the case, by the way, that most of the media, well, in fact, even the Guardian supported, uh, supported us in this. But amongst academics, it was somewhat of a different story. So you had the radicals mobilizing. There's always that group of radicals, typically the student unions, radical uh, professors, getting together on Twitter creating a storm. So they created a storm around this event and they said anyone who thinks the threat to the West from migration is a legitimate debating point complicit in, for example, mail bomb vi anti-Semitic violence uh, in Pittsburgh. You know, they tried to tie us to these various events. So catastrophizing, as Jonathan Haidt would say. Uh, so leveling these accusations, they were able to raise the temperature. Um, Matt sort of said, I'm getting too much heat on this and I'd like to change the title. And eventually we did change the title, although David Aronovich in his Times column very much criticized that change, and he's probably right. Um, and so, but not, not satisfied with that, they then um, started an open letter, which got, I think, three or, three or four hundred academics to sign, including a number of my colleagues who I see at committee meetings. Uh, so <laughs> that kind of made life a little uncomfortable. Um, and, but also at the same time, there's that public pressure. There was also the internal private pressure. Um, I was getting email. Uh, privately from within my institution asking me not to t take part in this event. So that kind of shows you the sort of pressures against these kinds of debates that were going on. Um, in terms of the solutions, one of the things that um, we did is we wrote an article a couple of days after the very successful event took place uh, where we said, okay, so we've, we've been charged with having a title that's offensive to disadvantaged groups. We're going to test that claim empirically. We've been charged with uh, using a far-right trope that's going to radicalize white people against minorities. We're going to test that claim empirically. And so we, did, we had a sample of about 300 people. Uh, in, in, there are survey platforms that you can run these quite quickly. And what we actually found was, lo and behold, you know, in social science, typically on a thermometer scale of zero being not offended at all, 100 being really offended, if you get to a 50, then you can start to say there's a level of offense here. Um, the, uh, the level we got was 28 out of 100, right? A blank page got 11, right? So, so, <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, so yeah, not exactly a great deal of outrage from, from the people we surveyed. And more interestingly, uh, the 80 ethnic, so we got a, a fair sample of ethnic minorities. They didn't differ at all from the whites in terms of level of offense, right? So all of these claims about disadvantaged groups being really, really offended just weren't borne out in in the survey data. Another thing we did was we said, okay, well, how about people's feelings towards minority groups? Were whites who read our um, debate description more hostile towards minorities? And again, the answer is no more hostile than people who didn't read our debate. So again, trying to get use science and empirical evidence to debunk some of these superlative claims that the radicals are making. We, interestingly, one of the people who signed this open letter was a, a guy called George Cicerellio Maher, who you may have heard of. Who, he's the guy who tweeted, all I want for Christmas is white genocide. Um, so that, that tweet actually was rated as offensive at a 59 out of 100. So anyway, just a bit of irony there. Um, the second event, which just took place last month, um, was an attempted no platforming of, of my good self at <laughs> University of Bristol. Um, and again, around, even though you know, I'm part Chinese and Latino, and the book was actually talking about race mixing in a positive way, but no, that still, I'm terrible white nationalist. Um, and so anyway, you have academics at, at the University of Bristol uh, organizing along with student union uh, activists this no platform. So on Twitter, they're talking about, we're going to shut this event down. We have to shut this. And we're not going to allow this to happen. Um, what, what's really interesting here is, at least uh, from my perspective, is the resistance to this occurs, first of all, amongst 
uh, graduate students who were actually interested in what I have to say and they wanted me to come. Uh, but also the fact that the department and the university were very gun-shy about adverse publicity. They didn't want to be seen as um, more or less scared to have this debate, so they were worried about their reputation. The university was worried essentially that government and media scrutiny would make them look like a bunch of snowflakes. So that's actually suggesting that these sorts of things can have an influence in changing people's calculus and starting to switch the system so we need it to, to go past a threshold point where we can tip it the other way and get the herd moving in the other direction. So that was a sort of lesson I took from this is that they are feeling pressures in the other direction against no platforming, not just from their own radical students. And on the day, we didn't know if they were going to no platform. It turned out they, they didn't. We had security on the door, so that may, may have made some difference. But in the end, it was just 20 some odd students who kind of meekly got up and left but videoed themselves so they got 50,000 views and, and I think for them that was job done. I don't think they actually cared about what I had to say or, or even whether the event went ahead. Um, and so good for Bristol, they said, you know, Bristol's fully committed to freedom of speech, rights for all students and staff, uh, and while aware of the concerns, we expect them to be discussed and debated in a measured way. Um, so they actually stood up for uh, honest debate, which is great. It's not to say they always have. A month previously, they sort of postponed a talk by uh, another speaker, which was deemed contentious. So perhaps the heat they got, I don't know, but perhaps the heat they got from that may have influenced their decision um, when it came to me. Um, OK. So really, what are the lessons of this? I think the lessons of this are that um, there is a sort of system dynamic around it, that it's very important for us to get this sort of left modernist system over the threshold tipping point to the point where uh, we can begin to tip, tip the system the other way. And this is how it might work. That the more universities and departments are aware of reputational damage through being portrayed as anti-free speech, anti-reason, snowflakes, etc., the more they feel pressure from politicians and the media, perhaps from their donors, perhaps from their students, the more they might stand up for free speech. The more universities that do stand up against attempted no platformings and other violations of free speech, the fewer, you know, that'll leave fewer universities behind. So the ones that are isolated are going to feel more and more and more pressure to jump on board this bandwagon. And so I think, again, we have to get into that positive feedback uh, where universities who are on the fence see others moving and decide, yeah, we better go with free speech. And then once that happens, I think things will change very quickly.